has to be a pure guess in this case because we're not making a claim. We're not saying, oh, it's 50%. What we're saying is, if you can't, by pure guess, it'd be 0 0.2, 0 0.2, because one out of five chance of getting it right. So then what is our alternative hypothesis? <laughs> Why greater than? Because the one that we found was greater Boom. The only piece of evidence that we have to make an alternative hypothesis, if someone said, hey, Antonio, do you think our class can taste the rainbow? And you're like, well, I don't know. What do you mean? Someone who can't taste the rainbow has a 20% chance. We did this big experiment here. We took 10 minutes doing it, and we found 0.54. That's not nothing. That's our alternative hypothesis. So what we'd say is P equals 0.2 for that one. This one would be P is greater than 0.2. Our evidence for our alternative hypothesis would be we actually did this experiment, and we, out, we have 59 out of 110. We're going to evaluate this at a 0 0.05 significance level. 0 0.05 significance level. OK, yes? So like, if the, the random chance of getting it was, like, say, there were three Skittles and it was like higher than 0 0.2, and then the, the proportion, like, what we got would be lower than that, would you say for HA we should be less than that? So let's say we did this big experiment, and ours had yielded that it was 0.17. What would our alternative hypothesis be? Less than, less than 0.2. Wait, okay. But it doesn't have to be 0.2 because we just picked that? Like, it could be a plus one number? We picked, so we picked 0.2 here because that's the chance that we just guessed it. Like, that's, that's the oh, probability yeah. of just guessing. Like, yeah. Hill's like, I don't know, red. Okay, well, he'd get it right about 20% of the time because, over many, many trials because you'd have a one in five chance of actually picking the color. So then our alternative hypothesis is compared to just guessing what happened when we actually tried. We have 0.54. So we actually do have a pretty reasonable suspicion to think maybe there's something to this. Maybe it is greater than 0.2. Now, what's the name of our procedure? What we're going to be doing is how many samples did we take? Because we compiled them, remember? One sample Z test for proportion. <coughs> what I'd like for you to do is with your group or your pair, please check the conditions necessary. How many are there? Three. Three. What are they? Random. Is it random? Is it 10%? Large count. Is it large count? Please check those. Make sure you show all appropriate work. What I'm comparing is, is my 110 less than one-tenth of all skills? That's my second column. Third condition would be large counts. What do I need to show in large count? So we're going to take our hypothetical probability here, so our h sub 0. We'll use our 0 0.2. That's 110 times 0 0.2. 22. And we need to show that it's greater than what? Greater than or equal to 10. Greater than or equal to 10. Why do we do this? All of it, any of it. What are we trying to do? We want to, we want to have an appropriate sample size for what? Which part's the normal part? Large counts. Why in the world do we want to see if it's normal? Why do we want to see if the distribution is normal? Easy math. Easy math to do. Okay, we want to put a number on this. 
We want to see how likely. And the second that you ask how likely, you're asking about probability. What's the beauty of the normal curve? What's the area under the normal curve? One. Which represents what? One is 100%. So to show that this is normal, now this gives me the ability to find a probability for my specific value. Do you understand that? And so once I say that it's normal, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, the distribution's normal. So then I can say my value has a probability of happening this percent of the time. Well, then all of a sudden, Jared, that's our alpha level. Oh, this happened 30% of the time. Oh, easy. Didn't happen by chance. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we're doing. General formula. This is kind of where we got a little bit, not stuck last time, but I... I think I may have said something that confused you. What do you need to have here? Well, this is what you've got from your formula sheet. Test statistic equals I'm curious to see what you're going to say here. What does this formula represent in this case? Yeah, that's a z-score, okay? So why do we need to find a z-score? So you can find your p-value. So you can find your p-value. So then in our specific formula, we're going to say z is equal to p hat minus p to remind us that we're using proportions. And then we can put in the standard deviation formula. Why are we allowed to use the standard deviation formula now? Because why? No. Nope. Because 10%. Because the 10% condition, we can use the standard deviation formula. I am going to let you, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you, empower you to do the next part. So when we have a picture of the normal curve, what do we need to have next to our normal curve? The mean and standard deviation. The mean and the standard deviation. Do you have the standard deviation yet? No, but you will, and you can use it from here. So go ahead and piece together the work to find the z-score, the work to find the picture of the normal curve with the standard deviation and the mean, and then find the p-value. <coughs> Admittedly, there's a couple of different ways to do this, but I'm going to let you decide. You can either use your z-score with table A, or you can use your normal CDF. We'll check back in in just a second here. So, so let's check it out. So um, specific formula we had. Let's, let's do a little picture of the work. Actually, let's, let's work on this here. z equal to 0.54 minus 0.2 over... 0 0.2, 0.8, over 110. What did you get for your z-score? 8.7. What's your z-score? So let's just say this is true for just a second here. So let's look. When we draw the normal curve, let's just just conceptualize here for just a second. If we draw a normal curve and our mean is 0.2, so that's within the middle, what's our standard deviation? What's just the standard deviation piece? Is that what you got? Okay. So think about what this means for just a second. Standard deviation is 0.04. What are we assuming is true in this model? That point 0.2 is the actual true mean. Or sorry, the actual true proportion. So what we're saying is assume that it's point 0.2. Okay. That would give it a, a standard deviation based on our sample size of point 0.04. And if you understand, which I think you do, standard deviations, we go three standard deviations above, that's we're way outside the data, right? Well, three standard deviations above is like not that much. So now go back to our z score. So we are 8.9 standard deviations above the proportion that we're claiming in h sub 0 is true. So what's our test statistic here? 0.54. You sure? The test statistic is the z-score, so that's actually what goes here. That's 8.9. What if you didn't do z-score? So let's just let's figure out what we're getting at. Hold on a second. So if you didn't do test statistic, you just end up with a p-value, p-value, right? 
So who converted it to a p-value? Did you use normal CDF or did you use um, table A? Oh man, so table A doesn't have it. Table A doesn't have it. Okay, so so let's say you have to use a calculator here. So so check this out. So well, or so Madison, here's compelling evidence, right? So let's just say, let's say you get this on the AP test for whatever reason, and they say, how do you? What do you conclude? Well, you can use logic. You can say the 68, 95, 99 rule says that if I'm more than three standard deviations above. I'm outside of 1%, right? Do you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So if I'm one, two, three standard deviations above, this is three. So you could say I am way beyond three standard deviations. Therefore, it is very unlikely to get this by chance. Unless they specifically ask you for the p-value, they would allow, they typically allow that as an explanation. Because what they're saying is, you know what you're talking about. You know that it's outside of three standard deviations. So if you said, I know it's almost nine standard deviations above, so it is way unlikely, meaning we have evidence against the null. But let's just say, let's just say you did what Annie did, and you did this. Normal CDF. What you put in is your values. Um, negative 0.038 as the standard deviation. That's what I'm getting at. So I want to see. I want to see what happens here. So if we're doing the opposite, I got like a number that was like 0.000 because I switched to 0.4. So let, let's just say you put it in like this, and so then you put in 0.2 here, and you put in 0.04, and obviously you had your labels, right? So then you put upper, lower. So what'd you get when you did this? Okay, so she got one, meaning there's a 100% chance that it is at 0.54 or below. 100% chance. So what does that mean for our conclusion? Or if you did it the other way, you got an astronomically low number, a very, very low number, meaning at the alpha level, At the alpha level of 0.05, what do either of these pieces of information mean? Yeah, so what we would say is, how do we say it? If If a sub zero is true, so keep that in mind. What are we saying? Do we have evidence for or against the null? Um, We have convincing evidence against the null. Because our, our probability of getting what we got by chance is so low. Yes. Okay. So if I didn't so have a number and I got the small number, Yeah, so for this 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 one's kind of a tricky case because we're not even close. So you could say for your convincing evidence, you could say we have convincing evidence against the null because our value is over nine standard deviations above the mean or above the the proportion. So there's a couple different things you could say for this one because it's not even it's like not even close. So you can either take it from a standard deviations perspective if you did this test statistic, or you could do it from a p-value evaluation. Okay. So um, I want to talk about. Was that? 
Oh. Uh, so we have we have convincing evidence against the null, and like that's that's what I was kind of like I'm sort of torn about what to say because it actually might be more convincing to say do more than nine standard deviations above, but you could say uh, because p hat equals point zero 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 one uh, against the alpha level. So, is that okay? I'm kind of torn about how to do this next part. I think we're just going to go to the check your understanding because there's a little wrinkle in it. Go to the check your understanding on the back. We're going to come back to All right, so here we go. There's a little wrinkle in this one that I want to talk about, and I think you're going to, I, I think you're going to understand where we're coming from. So here we go. According to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, job stress poses a major threat to the health of workers. A news report claims that 75% of restaurant employees feel that work stress has a negative impact on their personal lives. Managers of a large restaurant chain wonder whether this claim is valid for their employees. A random sample of 100 employees, employees finds that 68 answer yes when asked, does work stress have a negative impact on your personal life? Okay, if you're the restaurant owner, what are you thinking now? <laughs> I've got issues, right? But do you think that the 75% claim is true or not? No. No, what do you think? It's lower. There's your H sub zero and your H sub A, right there. Okay, so just hold on to that for just a second. So in the back of your mind, when you read these prompts, think about that. So here's what the actual question is saying. Do these data provide convincing evidence at the alpha level equals 0 0.10 that the proportion of all employees in this chain would say yes differs from 0.75? Okay, differs. What does it mean to differ from something? What could, what could it be? Above or below. That's going to be a little wrinkle here. Let's, let's talk about some things. So I'd actually like for you to work on the state portion here. Okay, so um, work on the state part here, where you parameter, statistic, hypothesis, significance level. So work on those four things before we get started on the next little piece. Our P, our parameter, is the true proportion of employees who say yes. Our statistic is this P hat. This is what we have. We asked our employees, so it's 0.68. What are the hypotheses? Well, the assumption, the null hypothesis is what? That P is equal to 0.75. So here's where it gets a little tricky. What is our alternative hypothesis? So I've got a P does not equal 0.75, or P is less than 0.75, or what else? Could be greater than, but we're, but our, yeah, right, okay. So this is where you need to look at the question, okay? So this is where you need to look at the question. What question are they asking? And they're going to use one key specific word that I'm going to have you circle. The word differs. Differs, <laughs> circle differs. Differs, and the more you say it, the stranger it sounds. Differs implies what we call a two-sided test. The process is going to be the same, but what we're asking is not is it greater than, not is it less than, but is it different than. And so our alternative here, correctly identified, would look like this. P is not equal to 0.75. Very good. Okay? Because that could mean that it's greater or less than the two-sided test. So here's what you need to think in your mind. If you ever find yourself writing this for your alternative, you have a two-sided test. Because you need to determine is it above or below. Our alpha level is equal to what? 
Because uh, in the prompt it says evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.10. Oh, yeah. So they determine that alpha level. Now, name of procedure. One sample. Z test for P. What I'd like for you to do is work on checking the conditions and work on the do. When you get to the picture, uh, I want you to consider the nature, the two-sided nature of it, okay? So work on the work on the check the conditions and the do. So I, I see you guys grinding away on this. I wanna I wanna talk to you about like exactly what's what's happening. Check the conditions. Random sample of 100, that's a quote from there. Took a random sample of employee. Boom, that's good enough. You put it in quotes, it tells you that they got it from the prompt. One is less than one-tenth of all employees, as Madison was pointing out. How are we supposed to know? They're usually not going to trip you up on this unless they give you a very specific number. They pulled 100 of their 200 employees. Okay, well, then they're trying to, then they're trying to get you, but it says restaurant chain, so we're going to assume. Large counts, we use uh, the, hypothesis, the, the null hypothesis proportion. Both are greater than 10. And so we can assume normality. Here's where it gets different than what we just did. We're looking at our test statistic. Our particular sample that we took was below. But they're not asking about below. They're asking different from. And so when we evaluate ours, we would expect to get a z-score that is negative. Why? Because our is, ours is below. When we draw the picture, however, here's what we're looking at. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put the picture over this way. What we're looking at is something that's normal with a expected value, expected proportion here of 0.75. What did you find to be the standard deviation? 0 0.043. Now, here's what we're looking at. We are looking at 0.75 here. Here's our 0.68, and really it would be this, except that we have a two-sided test. And so what we're going to say is, we're going to draw our picture, and we're going to say it's really both of these proportions represented here. This is the two-sided nature of it. The word differs tells you this is what it is. So are you just drawing like that distance from the person who values because that is That was our that was our what our sample dictated. What if you got like point seven four? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. And so if our test statistic is Z equals negative one point six three. Did anybody find the p-value for this? That's correct. But that is the probability that it's 0.68 or lower. But we need the other part of that. So how do we do it? Double it. We double it because it's a two-sided test. So you may or may not be tracking with me right now. I think this, this conclusion is actually going to help. So let's, let's work on the conclusion here. And when we write it up, I think you're going to think, oh, OK, that makes a lot of sense. To understand how, was that? Okay, so to understand, to understand the conclusion, I know this, it's a little tricky, because my question was always like when I, when I was time I was in college, I remember asking my professor like, why do we double it? 
Like, why double that? Because we didn't get anything above. So why would we double it? We got below. So why double it? Here's the answer. To understand why we double it is to understand the nature of z-score. Z-score has to do with proximity to the mean, how far something is from the mean. So here's our conclusion. Assuming the proportion of employees plus you, who answer yes is 0.75. Why are we assuming that? That's the null. So we ran our simulation. We, ran, we, we drew our picture based on the fact that 0.75 was true. There is a 0.1032 probability of getting a sample proportion as far as 0.68 or further purely by chance. So remember, because, because it's symmetrical, what we're saying is, hey, the chance of getting 0.68 or lower was 5%. Well, because it's a normal distribution, those probabilities are symmetrical. So it's 0.68 or less, 5%. Well, it's just a distance. So the distance here is the same as the distance here. So this 5% and this 5%, because it's normal, get added together because it was equally likely to get something seven points higher as it is to get seven points lower. Does that make sense? What Lexi. Is, like, why do you say or that means, ah, yes, 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 yes. Because think about the curve, right? If Let's say if it was less than, and this was 0.68, and it wasn't, we weren't doing a two-sided one. We we're doing a one-sided one. We would say a 0.68 or less. Well, really, that just means further from the mean. And so instead of saying 0.68 or further, or 0.82 or higher, so because they're symmetrical, this is 1.63 standard deviations, this is 1.63 standard deviations, we just happen to get this one. But because it's normal, it's equally likely to get one that's 1.63 standard deviations above as it is to get 1.3 standard deviations below. Well, I don't. What we're saying is as far as 0.68 or further. Okay. So as far as is like the distance from yes. that out. Yes. So if it's this way, it's assumed it's the same way the other way. Yes, it is. Because then that's why we check normality, because normality is symmetrical. Just in the two sided one. That's correct. And they, they, how do they know it's two sided? Like, how would a new comparison know it's two sided? So the prompt, the, the when the prompt says differs from, does their do, do their results differ from the claim? And it's two sided. Right. So they all know. So let's throw this back to Antonio's example where we had the, the homework. We had the homework, right? And we said 75%, almost exactly the same thing, except I said he only found 58 people. Well, if I said, is my claim, is my alternative hypothesis that the proportion is less than? Well, maybe Antonio makes that. He says, I think it's less than. And we evaluate it. But Lexi says, I'm not sure. I don't think it's 75%. I think it's different than. And she takes another, she takes another one. Well, less than means it has to be below. Different than means it could be more, it could be less. She just thinks the claim is false. She just thinks it's not true. He thinks it's less than. 
that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you see the word differs, does it differ from the claim? You have to take into account, well, it could be above or it could be below, in which case it becomes not equal and then it becomes a two sided test. Antonio, you had a question a while ago. No? no? Yeah, Amy did. The, the whole field with the tails, why are you not, with the graph, why are you not finding the middle part or like Because you're finding out how, how unlikely it is that you're claimed or more extreme. So let's think about what this would mean. Yes. So it's like, let, so when you when you poll these restaurants, restaurateurs, right, um, they get 68%. Well, what if I would have gotten 66? That would be, it would be, if the 0.75 is true, 66 is less likely. If the 75% is true, 82 is unlikely. If 75 is true, but 90 would be even less likely. So what you're doing by, by accentuating the tail is you're saying, what I found in proximity to what's or more extreme, either greater, far greater than or far less. Okay. Um, we fail to reject the null. We don't reject the null because we are greater than the alpha level, meaning we, it's not so extreme that we would throw it out. So here's a follow-up question. A 90% confidence interval for the restaurant worker data was also created and found to be 0 .0, 0 0.603272, explain how the confidence interval is consistent with but gives more information than our test. So think about it for a second. What does it mean to be consistent with our test? The information agrees. The information agrees, meaning we don't have we don't have enough information to reject the null. We failed to reject the null. We didn't say it was true, we said we failed to reject the null. So what? What does this confidence interval have to do with that? What's it? You're right. You're right. But does it matter? It doesn't matter. So what she said was, in this confidence interval is what number that's really important to us right now? 0.75. Well, 68.68 is in there also, right? <coughs> but this confidence interval, what is a confidence interval? Interpret a confidence interval. We are 90% confident that? The interval from this to this captures the true proportion of restaurant workers that would say yes, okay? So in many, many confidence intervals, about 90% of them would capture the true mean. So that means what we say is, what we say is, well, hey, check it out. I just said, I just had a test that said 75 could happen. I'm not going to reject that. That could be true. And then someone throws out this confidence interval, and they say, well, is, can 75 even be true? It's at the top end. Does it matter? No. No. So what we say is the null value of 0.75 is included in the interval. So it is plausible. So it's plausible. What is the benefit of this interval, though? Annie kind of touched on it with, her, with your comment about 0.68. What's the benefit of an interval? Let's we'll say Jack goes out. Ooh, elaborate on that a little bit. Yes? Talk about this interval, though. I feel like it kind of 
proves that none of them can be true. I guess it shows them like all and then you have options to say like all the other reports and there is an asterisk and it's all included in it and it shows the multiple actions. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes, exactly. It shows you multiple options. So let's say Jack owns a restaurant. He's like, you know what? I don't believe this at all. People are super satisfied in my restaurant. I want to know. And he goes out and he's like, I'm doing my own sample. And he doesn't know how to run a, a one sample Z test. And he doesn't know how to do it. But, but someone gave him this confidence interval. And he goes, well, I got 0. 0.63. Is that good? Is 0. 0.63 OK? How do you know? It's also in the confidence interval. So to Madison's point, it gives you other plausible values. So one of the benefits of the confidence intervals, it gives you other plausible values.